family. Happy Sabbath to you. Beautiful day outside, isn't it? Even if you get stuck on the traffic on I-20, it's still beautiful. I know everybody don't come that way, but wow. We want to start our worship. We're practicing for the heavenly choir, so we want to get our tunes together down here. All right? Our first song is Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And I'm going to do a little exercise on one of the choruses, so I need you to uh, pay close attention and gather in some wind because you're going to need it. All right? Let's, Let's try it. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long <clears throat> perfect submission perfect delight visions of rapture now burst on my sight angels descending bring from above Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long perfect submission all is at rest i and my savior Am I happy and blessed? Watching and waiting, looking above. Watch me now, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Here we go. This is my my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my saint. Ladies, you're all the day long. Amen. Some of you have some Wheaties this morning. That is great. 340. 340. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. He's the only one 
that saves. We have heard a joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the gladness all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Wafted on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell the sinners far and wide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing ye islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean caves. Earth shall keep her jubilee, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy craves. Sing in triumph o'er the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. High is hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Amen. Good morning, church family. I have a few announcements for you. I'd first like to welcome all of you here and uh, extend our gratefulness to any folks that are visiting with us today. We'd like to welcome back Pastor Jerry and Miss Barber. Thank you for coming back to play in our sandbox for another day. We appreciate it very much, you, uh, your ministry. Um, the first announcement, there's something about a wedding tomorrow um, for someone, um, Pastor Jason, I believe. Yeah, um, so let's just keep Pastor Jason and Angela in their, in our prayers as they uh, prepare to tie that knot tomorrow, and life will be changed forever for both of them, in a good way. Yes, in a good way. Um, second announcement, uh, Vespers tonight, there is a change in the title. The new title is, It's Time for Peculiar People to Shine. Is that correct? All right. I've been told that's correct, so it's time for peculiar people to shine. That sounds like us. Uh, third announcement, um, I want to bring your attention to the Personal Ministries Fair in your bulletin on April 28th. This will be a chance where you can, um, it'll be in the gymnasium uh, over at the school, and it will allow you to stop by different uh, booths or displays for the different ministries and see how you might be able to get involved uh, in the ministries of this church. Uh, number four, uh, to bring your attention to the Daniel test. Um, at the top of the page there on the right-hand side, the 10-day Daniel test. Also, there's a date change for the April fellowship meal. It will now be April 28th, two weeks from today, instead of the third Sabbath on April 21st. And two final announcements. Uh, all elders, pastors, assistants, and church board members, you are to meet behind the, uh, in the room behind the platform after the service. And also, for the congregation, there's an important announcement to be delivered today as soon as the closing song. 
has been completed, so please stay around for that. You can read your bulletin for the remainder of the announcements. Andre is going to continue to lead us in our praise songs. Thank you. As we prepare our hearts for service, let us stand together and sing Hymn 338, Redeem. His child and forever I am. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. Redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem how I love to proclaim it his child and forever I am I think of my blood sits redeemer I think of him all the day long I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem. I love to proclaim it, his child, and forever I am. I like the last verse. I know I shall see in this beauty the king in whose law I did lie. Who lovingly guided my footsteps and giveth me song in the night. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. I've been redeemed by the blood of the land. Redeem how I love to proclaim it, his child and forever I am. Beautiful. Amen. Amen. As we Invite the Savior in our worship today. Let us sing together our worshiping adoration. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Adore him, Christ the Lord, for you alone are worthy, for you alone are worthy, for you alone. Christ the Lord 
Heavenly Father, thank you for this blessed day. Thank you that we can be together again, friends with one another, brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us, Lord Jesus, to recognize the fact that you are here today in our midst, ready to bring your blessing on this Sabbath day, your holy day. And I pray, Father, as we've gathered here, we've come with open hearts to hear you speak to us. And I pray that we've come with open hearts to be changed as well as filled with your Spirit. Oh, Father, bless us this day. Let us just rejoice because you love us so very much. And let this be an hour of worship of our God our Savior, our King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The song says, Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, provision in splendor and girded with praise. the King, all glorious above, oh gratefully sing His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor, and gird it with praise oh tell of his might oh sing of his grace who robe is the light whose canopy space his chariots the wrath the deep thunder clouds form and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light, it sweetly deals in. in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, indeed do we trust nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies how tender how firm to the end, I'll make a defender, redeemer, and a friend. Amen. You may be seated. Time now for our children's story. We're calling all the children up. Do not accept any pennies, dimes, nickels, quarters. We want the silent treatment today. 
ones, fives, tens, fifties, one hundreds, five hundreds, one thousand if you have it in your pocket. All right? All our children, please come up and uh, listen to the wonderful story we have for you this morning. Good morning, guys. Happy Sabbath. Okay. Today I'm going to tell you about our exciting adventure when we went to Goodale State Park. Okay. <clears throat> we were really excited to go there because this park does not have hiking trails. It has canoeing trails through a cypress forest. And we were so excited. So we got there. And we got our canoes. And you start off on this big, huge open lake. Let me get the picture and show you how beautiful this big open lake is. I guess I should have probably put them in order to begin with. But do you see how nice and big? And do you see how the trees are? Right out of the water. These huge cypress trees right out of the water. Okay, so we got our canoes. See the size of our canoes? And we were out there on the water. And then we saw this sign posted on a tree, the trail marking sign. And we were like, yes, we found a trail. So we started to follow it. But then we realized, oh, we've got to keep looking for these signs on the trail. But they were posted in crazy places, huh, Addison? Some of them were like underneath a branch on the tree, like pointing you in that direction. So we had to look really hard, and it got really tight. If you can see these pictures, it got really tight, and we were really close. We started off to where we could have our two canoes together out on the lake, and we were paddling along, but then it got really close, all right? So we're, we're going through, and we're searching for these, and we're having a really good time, and we're listening to all the birds and all these beautiful things that we're seeing out there, beautiful flowers, these lilies and everything. We're really enjoying it. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> as we were going along, like, sometimes the signs would be really close together because we'd have to make a turn here and then a turn there. And we, we, we found the signs really quickly. But sometimes we'd be paddling along and we were like, oh, did we go the wrong direction? Like, where's the sign? And everyone was kind of freaking out. And then all of a sudden, no, here comes a turn. And then we saw the sign. We're like, whew, okay, we found it. So, as we're going along, we came across an alligator. Now, we had been taking these turns, and it was really difficult because Mr. Chris was in a canoe with Addison and Sophia, and I was in a canoe with Walker and Raylan. And this is my first time piloting a canoe all by my own self, and now we're going through a cypress forest, which was not. So there was a lot of trees getting hit by... Uh, the canoe. And <clears throat> um, we were taking turns kind of wide, um, but this time uh, we didn't take it too close to where we hit the tree. We took it wide, and it was a good thing because there was an alligator sitting there right next to the tree. Now, I'm pretty sure this gigantic alligator, let me show you. This is how big he was. You see how big he was? Now, that's not really context because this guy was bigger than the canoe I was in, okay? Huge crocodile, okay? And this is what he was sitting on. This is how close we were to him. So like, well, farther than this. But it was close, okay? So Mr. Chris is then taking these pictures of this alligator. And um, him and Addison had just decided that this must be a dead alligator because it's not even breathing. And then its tail smacks the water and splashes water all over me and Walker and Raylan. And then he sinks down under the water underneath our canoe. Now, I was really freaking out, but mommies cannot be terrified, especially in terrifying situations, because who, you know, everybody would lose control after that. Somebody's got to be in control. So <clears throat> I didn't scream, and it's a good thing because Sophie was screaming enough for all of us. But <clears throat> we calmly and slowly, because I had lost all of my strength in my arms, and canoed our way, paddled our way past the alligator to where we were, and we all were looking for the next sign, and then, whew, we followed the next sign. But I was pretty much done after that. So eventually, we turned around, and we came back the other way. Now, when we were coming back the other direction, there was completely different signs. Signs in different areas, and different types of signs that we were looking for than when we had originally gone the other direction. So now we were worried because now we had to look for and find completely different signs. But we also knew there was an alligator up ahead of us. Before, we didn't know there was any alligator, so we were just having a fun time. Now, 
everyone was pretty tense because we knew we were going to come across another alligator. And pretty soon, we came around the corner, and there he was, just like TikTok Croc, sitting there with just his head above the water. And we're like, oh, there's the alligator. And then slowly, he slips under the water, and we just see bubbles coming towards our boat. But we just calmly paddled past him and kept going. And it was hard getting back. But pretty soon, we came around the final corner, and we saw the open water of the lake. And we were like, oh, thank goodness we're out of there. And then we just had to paddle all the way back to shore. So through that whole experience, it really made me think that life is just like paddling through a cypress forest. All right. So... The world is kind of like the open lake, okay? You get your canoe, and you're just out in the open lake. But then you give your life to Christ, and it's like finding your first trail marker. And you're like, hey, this is the path I'm supposed to take, right? And as you're following the path that God lays out for you, he talks to your heart, and he talks to other people's hearts around you, but he also uses events that happen in your life to continue to guide you on the path that he's laid out for you, okay? So, once you find that first marker and you're following the trail, some of the signs that God gives you are friends that enter into your life or situations that happen in your life. Those are the sign markers along the way that you're supposed to be following that tell you you're doing a good job, you're on the right path. And some of them are really close together, but some of them are pretty far apart. So we have to be really diligent in looking for the signs from God. Now, sometimes bad things happen, right? When bad things or sad things or scary things happen to us, does that mean that we're not on the right path? No, it doesn't. But God allows bad things to happen to us. It tells us in James that we should consider it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds because the testing of our faith produces perseverance. So it's growing our faith in Jesus when bad things happen and we persevere through them. All right. Now, when we turned around, we had to look for completely different signs. Does that mean we're on the wrong path? Okay. No, it doesn't. Why? Because oftentimes God is refining you. Well, constantly refining you through your life. So oftentimes he's going to send you in a new or a different direction. And the signs that you're seeing on this path are different than the ones that you've already seen. But it doesn't mean you're on the wrong path. It means that God's leading you in a new direction. And we need to not look for the old signs, or we won't be going towards God, right? All right. Now, last, how many alligators did we run into? We ran into one alligator. But how many times did we run into him? Twice. Twice. I am telling you, when you get older, well, even now, there are things you are going to have to learn multiple times. Now, the first time, it was really scary because we did not know that it was going to happen. But the second time around, we handled it a lot better. There was no screaming or crying, was there, Sophia? So, um, sometimes bad things will happen, but they'll happen again. But we are prepared because we've already been through this, and we know that God has gotten us through this, and he's going to get us through the next thing. Remember, that's the building perseverance, okay? And last, I cannot tell you the blessed joy of seeing that open lake and finally getting out of that terrifying forest, but that joy that we felt when we saw the sun shining on that lake and the shore of the safety of that shore is not going to compare to the joy we are going to feel when Christ comes back. So I am telling you, Stay on the path. It can be scary, and the signs can be difficult to see, but that's why we surround ourselves with friends that help us to see the signs, and we keep praying, and we keep looking towards Jesus. Got it? All right. Does anybody want to pray for us? You want to pray? Amen. All right, you guys go back to your seats.
Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. As you know, we are here to promote Pathfinders and Adventures, but this time we are promoting Pathfinders for Oshkosh, Wisconsin. We, we wasn't on a mission, focus on mission, but every opportunity we got, we got to put, put us in. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, as you know, our big event coming up next year, 2019. So, we are here to act to promote that how far we are in planning this trip. You know, it's a big trip. So, we have a thing on the bulletin to see how far we are and then how much money we still have to meet that goal because it's a good big goal. So, John will tell you more of what's going on and then. Our not, and our fundraiser too also. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. 1984, I know some of you were only four years old, <clears throat> or some of you weren't even born. My sister was the Pathfinder director of my home church in Ridgewood, New York, when we hatched this plan in 1985 to go to the first international camporee in Camp Hale, Colorado, which is unlike anything that the Pathfinder groups have ever experienced. Over 16,000 people attended that one. Miss Melissa handed me this wonderful paper, and it floors me because the last friendship campery and forever faithful in Wisconsin, which is where they have it now, is in Wisconsin. They had 47,000 children and staff at that campery. That is absolutely amazing. This campery coming up next year, and I know you're probably thinking next year. Oh well, no, it's coming right around the corner because last year. We were all talking about this, going, oh, it's two years away. Guess what? We're only a year out now. They have 50,000 tickets for this thing. 50,000 people all in one place, representing from countries between, they're estimating from 60 to 100 different countries at this campery. You talk about phenomenal experience for your children. These kids, and even from my adventurer clubs, we've got three or four of them that are going to be graduating going to Pathfinders are going to be able to experience this next year. We've got six days there. I know from looking up, because Mr. Butch and I have been talking a lot about travel time and stuff, it's 982 miles from where you're sitting right now. I know my family and Melissa's family, we travel really well, but when you have a whole bunch of people in tow, Miss Quinn shuts the doors, locks the doors, and says there is no brakes until you need fuel. So it's going to take a while to get 982 miles up the road. I also know how much these children eat, because I'm one of the cooks. Our last campery, we went through 120 eggs and we ran out. <laughs> we went through several pounds of pasta and we ran out. And then Charlie, Mr. Charlie shows up and we look at him and go, okay. And then Mr. Stanley showed up one night for food. And that's when we had the veggie burgers and we had homemade french fries right on site so it was absolutely phenomenal so there's a lot of food that's involved in this enough to the point where we're talking about taking half the food up <laughs> and then going shopping finding walmart while we're up there and restock our trailer otherwise the trailer is going to be too heavy <laughs> it's going to be ridiculous 14 hours or so to get there the last time we've raised four thousand nine hundred eighty eight dollars since the last time we've done this we've raised another one thousand two hundred and seventy seven dollars that's a phenomenal increase, guys. Thank you so much for that. We have now able to send six Pathfinders and staff up there. That's fantastic. As well as almost the amount to send the truck and the trailer up there, too. Almost. We need that. We need the truck and trailer, guys. I mean, Pathfinders, okay, but we need the truck and trailer up there with us. You know, it's, and it's going to be an experience getting there, too, because just... If we do not have our own transportation in forms of a bus, the bus just to get up there is several thousand dollars just to go up there. So keep us in prayer. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, the title for it is God's Chosen in Oshkosh 2019. The Chosen Campery, guys. Please keep us in prayer for that. Our fundraisers over the summer, just because you think summer, everybody's on break, no. The Pathfinders will have, and we're putting together, a dinner and show for everybody that'll happen here. We're still in the early stages of this, 
So keep that in prayer too. You guys come out, we'll, the kids will be serving you supper like waiters and waitresses. And yes, you can tip them, but they're also gonna work for that. We're gonna give you a show with music and singing and such. Yes, ma'am. What is your financial goal? Each person without a short is back. It's 575. Yeah, they're not short. They estimated at 575. But per person. Per person. Five hundred seventy-five dollars per person. Because take a lot. Because the ticket, the ticket to get there and to um. Yeah, please. The registration is two hundred dollars, and that's non-refundable. So, and then plus food and tra transportation. So, so I have to register by the end of the year, everybody. Again, this is going to be a phenomenal thing for the kids. The last thing I want to talk about is your adventure clubs. And I say yours because it is your adventure club and your Pathfinder clubs have a ministry going on. It's Feed the Homeless. And we have been invited back. Actually, they want us to come back quite a lot. May 20th is when we're planning on going back out for breakfast. And hopefully it'll be a little bit warmer in the morning than it was last time. Last time, all the adults gathered in the trailer because that's where all the heat was. We got to a point where we had to drop the back door because it got too hot in the trailer. But we're feeding them breakfast again this year. Mr. Jim that I deal with down there at Hope Plaza is very excited. And I will tell you folks, my job as a paramedic, I'm out in Columbia in the middle of the night all the time. And there's people wandering these streets all night long and they're looking for food. I've seen people take food out of the trash cans I've bought people food. When I've stopped in at a gas station, I've bought them food so they can have or a cup of coffee so they have something warm to drink at night. It is a sickness and it is a problem that we have here in our wonderful city, in our wonderful state. Your children serve these people. They become servant leaders. These kids up here, as well as the rest of the Pathfinders and all the kids in this church are the future of this church. They are learning to be servant leaders to carry our mission forward. So May the 20th, if you guys can't come with us, that's fine. Please add a little bit of money to the offering plates and write, or in the, in the envelopes, write, feed the homeless so it goes into our fund because we're going to be buying a lot of food. And we send these people away with full tummies for their day, probably the only meal they may get that day. So keep us in prayer for that May 20th, as well as the Chosen Campery. Thank you, folks. Good morning and happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. I will call the deacons to come up front. It's time for us to participate in our tithes and offering. And I'm kind of going off script a little bit here. Um, I wanted to look at and talk about a little bit about Malachi 10, um, or Malachi 3.10, where it talks about bringing all your tithes into the storehouse so that there may be meat. Some verses say meat, other verses say food. And when I looked up that word meat, I was wondering what it was. And what I looked up, it said, with having no doubt. So basically it said, without doubt. And when I was in India, I just got back on the 6th of March, a young man that came out of the prison, couldn't have a job, didn't have a job, couldn't get a job, but he had a little bit of property. And he grew tomatoes. He didn't have any money to put into the, into the church, but what he did when he picked his tomatoes, his tomatoes, he took out 10% of the tomatoes and so much for his offering. And when I look at it and think about what it says, the meaning of without doubt, that is a love that God wants to perform in each and every one of us that we can live without having any question, any doubt of the goodness of God. So let us pray. Mercy, Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to participate in this life-changing experience that help us to grow to live without doubt. This is just one portion of it. And we just thank you for those that give, those who have to give, and those that chose not to give. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I know there are a lot of praises today.
And I know that there are um, many burdens on our hearts as well. And this is the time in our service where we want to invite um, you to share. I know that I have some that were written on the prayer box um, in the bulletin, and I have some that were written on the prayer list in the back that I have. And if there are burdens on your heart or requests that you would like prayer for today, um, I'll take a moment. Or if you have praises um, that you'd like to share with um, your church family, I'll, um, I'll give a moment for that as well. Are there any prayer requests or praises that you would like to share with your church family today? Well, I know that there are a lot written, and those will be remembered in prayer. We know that we have hurting families, hurting friends. We know that um, we're also celebrating many joys, um, new life and new relationships and, and being made new in Christ. And so um, Andre will lead us in our prayer song, and then I'll invite you to kneel if you're able um, and join me in prayer afterwards. Hide me, Lord, in your holiness. Every sin I now confess. Praise to you, forgive. God, there is no one like you. There is no one like you in all of heaven and all of earth. You ride across the heavens to help those in need. You ride across the skies in majestic splendor. You, eternal God, are our refuge, and your everlasting arms are under each of us. You go before us and make the way straight. You go before us and make the path known. You are a light to our path and a lamp to our feet, and your truth guides us. How great are your works. We know that you say, Come to me, all who are weary and all who carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And you encourage us to take time with you to allow you to teach us to be humble and gentle at heart. And when we listen and learn, we find rest for our souls because your yoke is easy and the burden that you give is light. We come before you today because we know that um, it's been another week. We may have forgotten you. We may have forgotten to put you first. We may have said an unkind word or missed an opportunity to be a witness for you. There's a whole lot of other things, and we bring those before you. We know that you are aware of our needs, that you know our hearts, and that you are there to comfort and to guide and to lead. We also know that there are many hurting families, those that have asked for healing, those that have asked for prayer, we um, ask for a blessing for Jennifer Washington and her family. We ask for healing for Miss Lillian and for Becky. And as Dave Brewer has surgery this week on Wednesday, we ask that you guide the surgeons, the doctors, nurses, and care team, that he has relief from pain and has a quick and effective and efficient healing. We thank you for the praises that you've given us too. We thank you for the way that you are at work in our lives, for bringing renewal, bringing restoration. 
We thank you for the wedding anniversary of David and Cindy Talley as they celebrate 34 years together. We thank you for the many milestones that you guide each of our families to. And we thank you for being with us on the dark and sad days as well. We thank you that you are a God who hears us, that you act as the good shepherd guiding and leading in all that we do. And so we know that when we ask these things, you are listening. You know what we need before we ask, and you send your angels to answer us in ways we can't imagine and we don't always see, but we know you are there. So today for our church family, we pray for your wisdom and for your guidance, for a humble spirit and a teachable heart. We pray for your presence today with the pastor as he carries your message and your word. And we thank you for being at work in our hearts and minds. And we pray all of these things because you are a good and great God. In your name we ask, amen. Today's scripture reading will be taken from 1 Samuel 14, verse 1, 6 through 10. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to give by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, do you do all that is in thine heart turn thee? Behold, I am the according to thy heart. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass unto over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say thus unto us, Tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, come up unto us, then we will go up for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand. And this shall be a sign unto us. Good morning. So I'm not going to say much because I'll cry, but this is a very exciting day for me because this is a dream come true to be able to sing with one of my kids. I've been waiting a long time for this.
Aaron and Kinsley, truer words were never spoken, were they? Or sung. Jesus does love us. Hey, it's good to be here again with you folks, to visit and worship today together and have the privilege of standing in this pulpit. It's a great honor. It's good to be back. Barbara's here with me again today, and we've already had a lot of fun meeting folks again and seeing them again. So that's been good. But I was noticing something, that Jason always has me come back during these big occasions. Took sabbatical, said he needed rest. Yeah, sure. Now I'm finding out why he was really on sabbatical. Finding himself a wife. Then he invites me back again. He's going to get married. And I'm wondering when the next invite comes back. We'll see. Wait a while for that one, right? But it is good to be back and see you all again. Military plans. They don't always go so well. And they're not always planned so well. Sometimes things are planned and they go very wrong. Back in 1876, a fellow by the name of Lieutenant Colonel George Custer had a plan. With his 7th Cavalry and 200 men, he went to put down an Indian uprising near the Little Bighorn. Little did he know that 10,000 Native American Indians had gathered there for war. And as he attacked with his 200 men, the planned charge didn't turn out so well. We remember how that turned out. Within an hour, I believe it was, all 200 men and George Custer were dead. Terrible plan. Terrible tragedy. Some of these military plans don't go so well. But today as we look at the scripture, I'm going to turn this one. We find another military plan that by all purposes should have turned out terribly. It was a very uh, bad plan from a military strategy. See, the Philistines had uh, invaded Israel. They had come with a very, very large force. The Bible tells us that 30,000 chariots of the Philistines had come into the land. 6,000 horsemen or cavalry were also part of that army. And then the Bible says they had footmen like the sands of the sea. Now that's a big force. And they'd come to do some real harm to Israel. But a fellow named Jonathan has a plan. And we read about it in our scripture, and I would like for you to take that scripture, make sure you have it open, and we're going to look at that plan again. Those very large Philistine forces divided up into three armies. They positioned themselves very well to attack Saul's army, to guard the uh, a supply route, and to maybe even encircle Saul's army, at least the army he had left. Because when when they realized how large this Philistine army was, Saul's army began to disperse and hide. Many of them hid in the caves, some into the pits that they found. Others just fled the country and wanted to get out of there because uh, the force was overwhelming. They were afraid. And because they saw how large this army was, Saul was left only with 600 men. Can you imagine that? Army of 600. Going to go up against this force. Not going to happen today. Saul's little army was so frightened they were frozen. They didn't do anything. They chose to just sit still, paralyzed with fear, did nothing. And that's when Jonathan devises this plan. 
an absurd, foolhardy plan. Let's read it again. 1 Samuel 14, verse 1. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. In verse 6 and following, Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. And so his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you, according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, Very well, let us cross over to these men. And we will show ourselves to them. And if they say thus to us, wait until we come down to you, then we'll stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has delivered them into our hand. And this will be the sign to us. What do you think? Was that a good military plan? Hey, buddy, are you with me? We're going to attack. <laughs> it sounds a bit foolish. Sounds like suicide to me. Two guys going to take on the whole garrison of the Philistines. Yeah, it sounds like suicide. But what important piece did Jonathan include in his plan? The Lord. Faith, right? He included faith. Wow. And that's a pretty important piece to include in any of our plans that we have, let alone going to war or going to fight. Faith. Trust in God. What can that do for us? What will God do for us when we have faith and trust in God? Wow. The story goes on, doesn't it? You see, for Jonathan, God's cause was way too important to allow the enemy to just come flooding into the land unchecked, unchallenged. When he saw the enemy coming into the land, he, his anger rose up. His hatred for the enemy of God rose up. His love for the nation of Israel rose up. His understanding of how important Israel was to God rose up. His desire to do something about the enemy coming into God's country rose up. And he was determined to do something about it with or without the help of anybody else. Praise God for his armor bearer. I said, I'll go. If you go, Jonathan, I'm right with you. I don't know if you get the impact of what's going on. I sure want to meet Jonathan. That's my kind of man. Dedicated to God. In love with God. Determined and knowing in his heart that God is with him. Certain that there's a God in heaven who cares. Believing and knowing that they have been called for a special purpose. And that the God who calls you to do something is with you and will do it with you. In fact, he'll do it for you. i got to meet Jonathan. Jonathan. 
I love this story. It's a reminder what God can do with a certainty like the song that was sung this morning. Jesus really, really does love you. See, Jonathan had already given the Philistines a whipping. If you read just a little earlier, a few paragraphs in this chapter, you find that Jonathan took his small force that he had, and he had about a thousand men. His dad had two thousand. And he took on the Philistines the first time, and he whipped them, and he ran them out of the country then. But it was a smaller force. And this time they've come back. They've come back with a force that they know for sure will crush Israel and take care of Saul's army once and for all. And they especially, they especially want to get a hold of Jonathan. Teach him a lesson. That's what this, in, that's why this invasion is all about at this time. Now, Jonathan's plan clearly testifies to his confidence in God, and I want to underscore that word, his confidence in God's faithfulness to Israel. And I believe, even more importantly, his confidence in God's personal love and care for him. Jonathan's trust was in a personal God, a personal God. His bravery is invigorated by a very close relationship with God. Knowing God builds trust, does it not? Doesn't it? If you really know God, not just about God, it builds your trust in God, does it not? And God's presence, when you're aware of the fact that God's presence is with you, doesn't it establish some confidence in you for God? You know God's with you? It gives you confidence that you can face the world outside, that you can get up and go out the door in the morning and know that God's with you, God is with your family, no matter what, it gives you confidence to face this world of ours. And boy, do we need it. Jonathan was trusting God. And it's evidenced, that confidence is evidenced in every one of Israel's heroes in the Bible. Do you know that? Think about it. Well, they may not have started out that way. And it might be a rather recent confidence that was gained. But every one of Israel's heroes had that confidence for God. You think about Gideon, how he overcame the Midianites and the Amalekites with just 300 men. God boiled it down, worked it down to just 300 men for Gideon that would go out and attack 120,000 <laughs> in a very simple way, throwing down jars and shouting, Sword of the Lord and of Gideon. That was it. God used it. Conquered 120,000. Haskell, God can do that. Yeah. Still today, right? God can do that. That's our God. Victory wasn't in numbers, but experienced in faithful confidence in God's presence. And it's motivated by personal experience when it is men and women of the Bible did great things. And I believe that when we have confidence in God, when we know He's present with us during the day, all day long, when you and I know that, great things will happen. Great things do happen. 
And I'm hoping and praying that today as you listen, God is speaking to you. And he's challenging you. Do you know I'm real? Do you know that I really love you? Do you know that I'm near and I know everything that's going on in your life? And in this church's life? Do you know? So now, Jonathan's plan. He's outnumbered 10,000 to (laughs) 1. You see, they divided their forces into three. He's outnumbered 10,000 to 1. Approximately. I believe Jonathan believed and accepted what, what David would say in the very near future when he faced Goliath. He hadn't done it yet at this time. But when Jonathan would hear those words of David, I knew he had to say, Oh, that guy and I were kindred spirits. I got to know this David better, I'm sure, because David said when he faced Goliath, The Lord does not save what? With sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. <laughs> Those were David's words. Jonathan loved that. His confidence was inspire, inspired confidence in his armor bearer. That's something else you want to pick up in this story. Jonathan's confidence inspired his armor bearer's confidence. You know, you walk alongside somebody that's full of confidence, man, it just boosts you up. It's contagious. You catch it. You have somebody that says, hey, we can do this. We can count on God. Come on, we can go forward. Let's do this. The armor bearer says, I'm right there with you. Yeah. Confidence builds confidence. That's what happened here with his armor bearer. So together, together they go up to this garrison, and it was a high, steep place, rocky and steep. It was a natural fortress that they had encamped in as part of their protection. They chose wisely to find their security in a place to camp. Philistines had a good spot. So Jonathan and his armor bearer, they make it to the base of this hill. And they make sure that they're seen. Hey, up there. We're down here. They wanted to be seen. Part of the foolish plan. Right? Part of the foolish plan. And then they listened. What would be said? And sure enough, this is what they heard. Come up, and we will show you something. (laughs) I'm sure they didn't say it quite like that. If you know soldiers, they have a little different vocabulary. And they probably said something that I won't repeat. You can only imagine. And so, without hesitation, Jonathan says, let's go. Let's roll. It starts climbing. And the Bible says it was so steep they had to climb on their hands and knees. Now, that's rugged terrain. And by the time they would get to the top, they would be exhausted. In fact, it would take them a little while, and the Philistines are standing there probably laughing, making fun of these two idiots, these two fools that are willing to take them on. And so they don't bother waking up the whole camp, thousands of of soldiers, no, no. They only gather around them the other men that are positioned there, guarding that particular spot. And so maybe there's... 30 or 40 soldiers in this unit that's in camp there, and they wake them up and say, hey, guys, you got to see this. we got two little scrawny dudes coming up the mountain. They're climbing up here to take us on. Let's have some fun. We're going to take our time enjoying killing these two idiots. That's what they're thinking. Now, Jonathan, you know, He'd be exhausted climbing up there. But when he gets to the top, he doesn't hesitate. He attacks. He attacks. And lo and behold, within just a a short time, he's killed 20 of them. 20. By one man. 
and his armor bearer picking up the pieces, going through, finishing the job. And that starts a stampede, not toward him, but away from him. Because God also adds to Jonathan's bravery. God also inserts himself into this battle. And he causes the whole mountain to tremble and to quake. And he wakes up everybody in the camp. Only they're awakened to terror and to fear. They hear screaming going on. They see men running. And when they come out of their sleep, somehow they are in, uh, imagine that they're being overwhelmed by a greater force. And they draw their swords. They start killing one another. And they run. And the tumult and the, and the noise of this battle now awakens Saul's army and those outposts that were spying on and watching to see what would go on for Saul quickly ran back and reported what was happening. Saul now rallies his 600 men. And they also join the fight and attack. The Bible says the others that were hiding in the caves, the other soldiers that were hiding in the pits, oh, they suddenly get encouraged that, hey, something wonderful is happening. And they join the fight. And those who ran off to other countries to, to, to get away heard that the battle was taking place, heard that the Philistines were running for their lives, and they came back and they joined the fight. And by the way, I like how the Bible makes it very clear. They really didn't have any weapons to speak of. The only ones that had a weapon or two was Saul and Jonathan. All the others were farmers. They had sharp sickles. They had sharpened points on their prods. Those were their weapons. And they went up against how many chariots? How many horsemen? How many footmen all armed and ready for battle? But what made the difference? God was with them. God shook that mountain, not Jonathan. And put them all terrified, running for their lives until they all returned to the land from which they'd come from. God had made the difference. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Nothing restrains the Lord from doing what he will do if we are courageous, confident, trusting in him. I want to ask a question. What would happen? What would happen to the spreading of the gospel if those who profess the name of Jesus had confidence in God were courageous for God? believed that he was a personal God involved in their lives with a mission for them to do. What would happen? Well, we saw a few disciples who walked with Jesus, who stood with Jesus, who saw him after the resurrection, so they believed in a very personal God, did they not? And they were energized, and they went out, and they moved the whole world with the message they had. Unfortunately, today, folks, so much secularism is taking over the world and unbelief that many of those areas that were won by the disciples are now all of another faith. Christianity is being stamped out in those places. The secularism in Europe and in the United States is having its taking its toll as well, isn't it? The gospel is not growing like it should, not under the circumstances we face today. I want to ask you another question. Has God got a plan for that? Does he? Has God raised up another voice for the end time? 
Has he? Have you heard of the Adventist church? With its three angels message. (laughs) Oh, for such a time as this. God has prepared a message. And do I dare say a people. What would happen if we as a people would really know God is near? God is involved in our lives. God has a message for the end time. God is counting on us to stand up and be courageous. What would happen? Let me tell you what I think would happen. I think every one of us would become so energized for the Lord. We would be so excited about our faith that when the question is asked, Has anybody got a testimony for the Lord this morning? (laughs) That would be the worship service. (laughs) Because we'd have experiences of having gone out during the week and having God lead us to people that are ready to be receptive and hear because he's prepared the way. I believe the mountains would shake again and God would awaken people everywhere that the end is near. And they'd be waiting and listening, wanting to hear what we have to say. Believe me, they're out there now. If we would take time to present the Jesus that we know personally with them. And you don't have to have, you know, all the degrees, the fancy weapons. God provides the simple weapons. Just know the word. Just get into the word. Have a personal experience with him that you can share a testimony. Great things would happen. A soul would be one to Christ. You know, if I were to walk around here in Lexington like I have in the past and, and, and run into people in and, and Columbia, I find... You know what? I find people like I find everywhere. It doesn't make any difference where I go. There are people needing the Lord. One doesn't have to travel to Africa. One doesn't have to travel to the South Pacific. One doesn't have to travel anywhere to be a missionary. They're right here. God's got to work right here for all of us to do. And when a soul is one to Christ, how many of the enemy are defeated? You say one? No. How many demons were cast out of the demoniac when Jesus cast them out there in Gadaria? Said his name was Legion, and I read somewhere, I think a legion in the Roman army at that time was about 1,200. So if that's true, thousands of demons were cast out of those demoniacs living amongst the tombs there in Gadaria. How many are defeated when you bring one person to Christ? Don't know. Maybe thousands. I know this. I know it's time. I know it's time, and I I believe in this church. I believe in this message. I believe in its power. I believe in the God who gave it. I believe he still exists. I believe he's with us every day, every moment. I believe he's called every one of us to be a witness. And I believe he's anxious to work in all of our lives, every one of us, every single one of us, to use us to his glory and honor. My friends, the next time the sky is filled with angels like it was for Elisha's assistant when he doubted, when he was afraid, 
thought that they were overcome by a great number of the enemy and the sky was filled with angels and he could say, wow, there's more for us than against us. The next time that happens is when the sky is rolled back like a scroll and the one leading the charge is Jesus Christ himself. I believe it's not too far away. God's looking for people to be courageous, to believe and have an experience with him like none other, that they've got something to share, something to tell. And that's you, and that's me. We serve a good God. We need not be afraid to tell others about him. Not at all. Not at all. What mountain will God shake to awaken people to where we are in the stream of time? I don't know, but I heard just last evening that this country, our country, is coalition attacking Syria, bombing cities there because they have used chemical weapons on their own people. What's going to happen? Nobody knows. God's going to shake a mountain. People are going to be saying, tell us about your God. If you have that experience with God and they know it. They're going to want to know it. God can save, conquer battles with few or many. He's not dependent on the many. All he's asking is for one, you and me, to be willing to be used by him.